criminal justice system. Also, I explore various mechanisms behind these findings across biographies, political ideology, and local public sentiment toward crime. Now let us talk um, about the data and empirical model used in the project. The main outcome data comes from the National Corrections Reporting Program. The two main outcome variables I use are admissions per thousand population and sentence month per thousand population. Sentence months correspond with the total maximum sentence. The election data comes from various sources and covers state legislature, attorney general, other state office, and US congressional races. The total number of prosecutors in my data is about 4,200 and roughly cover the years of the steepest rise in US incarceration from 1985 to 2005. Now, my main empirical strategy is to look at criminal sentencing outcomes and the relationship to district attorney election cycles. County level variation in the timing of DA elections provides substantial variation across counties that I exploit using a series of dynamic difference and difference specifications. In my analysis, about half of elections happen in presidential election years, 40% happen in midterm years, and 10% happen in odd number years. I limit my analysis to states with elected DAs who have four-year terms, which covers 41 of 50 states in the union. Here, I evaluate the expression either with time periods in months or in years. Y corresponds with one of two outcome variables, either admissions per capita or total sentence months per capita. In all the charts that follow, I normalize the results around a particular time period and set those betas equal to zero. And so the coefficients of interest are all the betas except beta for the normalized time period. Now in this section, I will show some early results. Here we have criminal sentencing outcomes relative to the time period two years prior to a DA election. All graphs I show on the following slides include controls for white share of the population and for per capita income. The shape of the graph is preserved even if these controls are removed. Now, this graph shows outcomes in log points, which approximates the percentage change. And as I mentioned, the results are normalized around the time period corresponding to two years prior to an election year. Since individual criminal cases are generally unrelated to each other, it is reasonable to interpret each dot as a collection of independent observations. Thus, the fact that the dots are close together and increasing in the period immediately preceding a general election suggests that there is in fact an increasing trend occurring during this time period. Now, this plot shows sentence month per capita for property offenses. One can clearly see that all the estimates during the election year are greater than zero which is not the case for the time periods before and after the election year. And it's also not true for the time period omitted from the graph, since that period has been normalized to zero. Also, one can see that the estimates immediately following the election year have the greatest concentration of estimates below zero, which is consistent with the perspective that political incentives and their impact on prosecution may be lowest just after an election concludes. Now this plot shows the admissions rate per capita across all offenses. Again, we see a clear, consistent upward trend in the outcome variable from about 10, 12 months prior to the election through the middle of the election year. In this next graph, we see the same plot for sentence months per capita across all offenses. Again, the same trend persists. In the election year, there appears to be a jump in sentence months and it appeared the lowest estimates occur in the year immediately following the election, which is a period on the far right that has the greatest concentration of negative estimates. Now, recent papers have discussed potential pitfalls when two-way fixed effects models have treatments that occur in multiple years. Sonia and Abraham proposed one methodology for an alternative estimator, which would be robust to this potential issue. In using this methodology, I normalize all estimates this time against the election year. So negative values for the CATT estimates correspond with a positive impact 
from being in an election year compared against non-election years. We can see that the reweighted estimates remain negative for both outcome variables across all crime categories. For the all offense estimates, the coefficients remain statistically significant under this alternative weighting methodology. Furthermore, the magnitudes of the coefficients for the all offense estimates are not too different from what I find in the original specification. Now, one might think these findings might be due to other elections that might be happening at the same time as district attorney elections. To test for this as one robustness check, I perform a similar analysis, this time removing all district attorney election cycles in which the election year is synchronous with those of other elected offices, such as mayors and sheriffs. In this slide, negative values correspond with a positive election year effect on outcomes. Here, the same trend persists. Election year outcomes are higher than those of non-election years when removing election cycles with a DA election was synchronous with mayoral or sheriff elections, and the effects are statistically significant. Now, note that this analysis only covers cases in which I, in which I could confirm either yes or no that the elections were synchronous. I've been able to gather much more data on sheriff elections than on mayoral elections, and I've been able to classify in over 60% of county year combinations whether or not the DA election is synchronous with the sheriff election. This plot shows estimates of the effects of DA election cycles on per capita arrest rates and per capita crime rates using a regression specification that looks at years instead of months. If anything, the election year volume of arrests and crimes are slightly lower than in non-election years. Though for the most part, the difference is not statistically significant. Now this plot is important because it suggests that the main election effects on sentencing outcomes are not explained by changes in the volume of arrests or crimes around elections. It provides evidence against the potential perspective that the DA election year effects are attributable to changes in criminal behavior or police presence or the behavior of other elected officials. In short, this plot is consistent with the notion that the election year increases and sentencing outcomes is in fact attributable to changes in district attorney behavior. Now that we've seen evidence that there is an increase in the emissions rate per capita and the total month sentence per capita at general elections approach, I'll provide a very short introduction of the potential mechanisms that are described in longer, uh, in, in more depth in the paper. So one step to try to better understand the mechanisms is to standardize a variety of different county characteristics and then interact them with the election year effects. This chart shows the association between standardized county characteristics and the election year effects based on a static difference and differences model. All characteristics represent the mean value from 1986 to 2006. The red vertical line represents the main effect, the election year effect in the absence of the interaction term with the county characteristics. What we see is that a one standard deviation increase in the total crime rate is associated with a five log point increase in election year effects for both outcomes. The relative significance of total crime rate is consistent with the perspective that greater crime rates impact public opinion, perhaps by galvanizing the public against criminal suspects, which in turn might increase the pressure that prosecutors face in being harsher on crime. This chart also shows the Democratic vote share, which measures the fraction of votes going to the Democratic presidential candidate in the prior election, is the second most influential county characteristic in the chart. It is negatively associated with the election year effects, and it is significant for both outcomes. The fact that the political ideology of the district is uh, associated with election year effects is consistent with the notion that it is public opinion or the public's general sentiment toward crime that may, be that may be influencing district attorneys. Now, if this perspective is true, then one would reasonably expect this effect to have changed over time. We are no longer in the tough on crime era of the 1980s and 1990s, for example. In the 1980s and 1990s, anecdotally, there was a lot more talk and perhaps perceived benefit from being a politician who is viewed as being tough on crime. 
This was a period of the spike in crack-related drug convictions, the passing of the 1994 crime bill, and the establishment of minimum sentencing laws around the country. The General Social Survey, which is a longitudinal sociological survey administered yearly, shows that in fact, the vast majority of the population believed courts were not harsh enough. The shaded region corresponds with the, with the approximate time coverage of the core empirical analysis in this study. Only after 1994 did the fraction of the population begin to decline who believed courts were not harsh enough. In contrast, those who believed courts were too harsh have become a growing share of the population since about 1994. In short, public sentiment toward punishment has been shifting over the last 25 years or so. I plan to perform additional analysis to see how public sentiment might be related to the election year effects I showed earlier in this presentation. Now to conclude. So in closing, one thing I would like to mention is that this project only evaluates the short-term cyclical impact of being in an election year on sentencing outcomes. It does not capture potential longer-term political considerations that might impact how DAs approach their work at all periods in the election cycle. This means the full impact of political incentives on DA behavior may be larger than what is found in this project alone. So much work on criminal justice reform to date has focused on improvement to the criminal justice system itself and to the laws that govern it. If political incentives and the harshness of sentencing have in fact declined in response to public sentiment, then this project highlights that focusing on hearts and minds, on shifting public opinion toward punishment, may prove beneficial in changing sentencing outcomes and stemming mass incarceration. Thank you very much. I welcome comments and feedback you may have. Thanks, Chica. So there is a Q&A feature in Zoom. If you have a question that you'd like to type out, you can use that. Um, and we can get the next speaker set up while we wait for questions. Looks like Anna has a question. Yes, go on. Oh, should I, should I read the question? Or? Yeah, if you want to read it out loud. Okay. Uh, quick question, wondering who was in the data that showed that the sentiment pre-1994 thought it wasn't harsh enough? Is there any sampling bias that you know of or how was the data collected? So the general social survey is um, representative at the national level. Um, and so uh, it, they sample uh, individual from all 50, I, from most, if not all 50 states, and then they do like a waiting uh, to um, get the estimate for the national sentiments across a variety of different indicators. And so I, I don't think that there will be much sampling bias, um, at least when it comes to like the, the methodology that they use in constructing that survey. Great. Thanks again, Chica. Yep. All right, uh, let's keep it moving then. Um, our next speaker is Julian Yarko. And the title of this talk is Breaking Taboos in Fair Machine Learning, an Experimental Study. Julian, you can go right ahead. You're muted. Uh, okay, thanks everyone for being here um, at this talk. So this is co-authored work with um, Sharad Goel and Rosanna Sommers. And um, in our project, we really want to sort of, um, you know, wrestle with what some of the normative and ethical considerations behind much, much of um, algorithmic decision-making and we are focusing in our context on risk assessment tools. And uh, just a brief primer, so risk assessment tools are used throughout the US, um, it, especially in criminal justice proce proceedings um, to determine some adverse outcome for defendants. Uh, the typical outcomes we're trying to predict are recidivism risk or the failure to appear. And there's sort of a discussion about the type of features that go into should go into these algorithms and in particular, whether uh, it should be permissible to use so-called protected features, which are features that sort of have a higher level of protection under anti-discrimination laws, such as race and gender. And among the general public and lawyers in particular, there's sort of this view that uh, the inclusion of these characteristics, these protected features is taboo, right? Um, and even under in the CS literature, even in sort of the fairness uh, through awareness literature, we see some hesitation and some wrestling with whether it should be permitted to use these types of features. For instance, some people say they should be 
limited to uh, training processes, but not to the prediction stage. And so in this project, we really want to ask why there is this hesitation and why, why there's this general sense, uh, sense that uh, protective features shouldn't be used. Now, to give you just, uh, 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 so in principle, there are different modes of ethical reasoning, and two of the pr most prominent ones are consequentialism and deontology. And so consequentialism really says we should judge an action or policy based on the outcomes it leads to. It's a bad action if it produces bad outcomes. And that notion is the, sort of encapsulated in this um, quote here by um, Eric Holder, who says that basing sentencing decisions on static factors and immutable characteristics such as race may exacerbate unwarranted and unjust disparities that are already far too common in our criminal justice system and in our society. So again, the basic idea being here, uh, we shouldn't use those characteristics in making decisions because it produces it, it tends to harm right marginalized groups. But there's a second notion of um, uh, morality and moral actions, which says, irrespective of the outcomes, an action can be good or bad to based on a value system that is sort of orthogonal to outcomes. And that is encapsulated here in this quote by Justice White in Missouri, Missouri v. Jenkins, who said that um, uh, you know policies shouldn't be uh, uh, explicitly dependent on, let's say, uh, race, because the government, government must treat citizens as individuals and not as members of racial, ethnic, and religious groups. And you see the sentiment reflected in much of sort of the legal literature, which is, we don't care so much about outcomes. It's just wrong to make a decision in an individual case based on their group membership, right? So for instance, it's just wrong to have a Black defendant put them or detain them because other Black defendants had a higher high recidivism risk. Right or similarly to release more black defendants because other black defendants tend to have a higher, uh, lower risk of recidivism. And so, consequentialist and sort of deontological notions of morality quite often point in the same direction, but not always. And sort of one classic example is the use of gender and risk assessment tools. Right. So in current risk assessment tools, we know that given a certain risk score. Uh, female defendants tend to have a, a lower rate of recidivism than uh, male defendants. And so if we allow the algorithm to see gender, right, and in, specifically include gender as a feature, it can take that into account and in, in fact, um, uh, uh, release more female defendants. Similarly, um, we have in uh, over-policing, so uh, there's a similar story in sort of the uh, risk assessment tools for Black defendants. So in some areas of the United States, we have uh, a lot of over-policing, which means that uh, many, uh, uh, many Black people have a criminal record. And cr a criminal record figures very prominently in risk assessment tools because it tends to be quite predictive of recidivism risk. But right, if we sort of allow the algorithm to see race then we would it would be able to figure out that in some areas, right, uh, criminal history is not predictive um, for Black people, and so it might detain fewer Black people uh, or suggest detention for fewer Black people because it is able to distinguish the importance of the criminal record for the for the prediction of the different subgroups. And so here you can see that consequentialist, right, would say, well, this is you know you have shown me that the inclusion of protective features actually makes things better for the group I'm trying to protect. So maybe we should use protective features. Whereas a deontologist would say, I don't care about outcomes, right? As a matter of principle, because it's just wrong to make decisions in that way, we should continue to blind algorithms in this way. And so this is really what we're trying to tease out here, whether um, the hesitation to the use of protective features is sort of fuel, fueled by um, uh, deontological concerns or whether it is really about consequentialism, whether it's a useful heuristic to try to protect marginalized groups. We conduct a survey experiment in which we have uh, a, a representative sample of the US population. It's representative with respect to sex, race, and ethnicity. We do two separate uh, survey experiments, one on computer scientists, one on practicing lawyers, um, as the ones who sort of deal most frequently with these questions of algorithmic discrimination. And so our experimental design is pretty straightforward. So it's a three-step process. And at first step, we explain to our participants what risk assessment tools are. We explain to them in particular what a race blind and a race tailored tool is. And um, uh, I should note we in the paper, we do something similar with gender, but in the interest of time, I'm going to focus on race here. Then we're going to manipulate the outcomes under the race tailored tool. And in a final step, we're going to determine people's preference, data preference for the, the race tailored tool. And the idea here is simply that if people are 
uh, people's preferences are uh, sensitive to the outcomes under the race teller tool, it means that they care about outcomes and uh, they're at least in part motivated by consequentialist concerns. Whereas if responses are largely uh, invariant to the outcomes under the race teller tool, it would suggest that people are deontolo have deontological priors and just as a matter of principle, don't want the use of protected features. Now, before we sort of dive into the conditions that we have, we can look at the control condition. So here we just explain to people what risk assessment tools are. And we say, okay, the state is considering the use of some risk assessment tool. Uh, do you want the race blind or the race specific tool, right? And so here you can see the results. So over 90% of respondents say they prefer the race blind tool, right? And only a small minority says they prefer the uh, race specific tool. And if we look at the, re the open text responses for why that preference exists, it typically is put forth that uh, uh, you know it would be the morally right thing to do, sort of this deontological concern, right? Deliberately making a tool that's racially based is biased and wrong, or another quote, using race as a factor to determine whether someone is deemed dangerous or not is morally wrong. So it seems like if you just ask people, the reason for their aversion to the use of protected characteristics is sort of a matter of principle, right? But then we have this minimal sort of uh, treatment condition here, whether we provide uh, respondents um, with uh, with the, basically a, a small blurb of information that I also presented uh, previously, which is sort of this idea that due to over policing, um, criminal record matters less for some black defendants, and so in those areas we might want to use race because what it, if it, if it can improve outcomes, right? And this is sort of we we say this is what some researchers argue, and then. To people who have been assigned to this uh, general what we call a general context condition we again ask them about their preferences on these tools and what we find is the following so we see a significant shift towards the approval of race specific tools right just by making people aware of the abstract possibility that their preference for or that a preference for blinding can actually harm the people we're trying to protect and so um, in, the, uh, in the general population and computer, among computer scientists and lawyers, we see sort of a pretty significant shift towards the approval or preference for race uh, uh, specific race tailor tools. And uh, for the general population and lawyers that uh, uh, the preference is indistinguishable from zero at traditional levels of significance here. Now, uh, if we look at the reasons they provide for their preference, we see that the reason giving also switches, right? Whereas before it was sort of deontological, oh, it's as a matter of principle wrong to use protect features. Now there's much more talk about precision and accuracy and outcomes, right? So one quote says, I think including the race specific criteria will help the algorithm make more accurate predictions and the teller tool will compensate for racial inequality and do a better job at predicting, the, uh, uh, predicting those who pose a risk, right? And so both, the preference changes and the re mode of reason giving changes after this minimal um, uh, uh, treatment. And then we have a specific context, what we call a specific context condition. So here we pre present people with actual numbers. Um, so under the race blind tool, we always say 50% of black and white defendants are released. And then we vary the, num the proportion of black and white defendants released under the Taylor tool. So we say, for instance, 70 versus 30%, 55, 45, 50, 50, 45, 55, and 30, 70. And so then we again ask, do you want the race blind tool or the race specific tool? And what we see is a general increase again in the acceptance of the race specific tool dependent on the fraction of uh, uh, black um, uh, um, uh, uh, defendants that are released under the race specific tool. Interestingly, we never reach sort of the, the same approval rating that we get under the general context condition, which you see as a, a horizontal dashed line here. And we assume this is because it's just the general context condition is providing a specific example and sort of is really graspable, whereas people are not swayed as much by abstract data. But this is sort of an, an, a somewhat open question. Now, in summary, we find that most people have a strong stated preference for blinding risk assessment tools to race. Um, the stated reasoning, if you just ask them, is primarily deontological, but at the same time, uh, they're also highly susceptible to outcomes, right? And we view them as sort of hidden consequentialists, people who care about outcomes, but if you just ask them, they wouldn't give state that they care about outcomes in this way. Now, what's the relevance? So first of all, we have to uh, uh, reinforce the notion or the, 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 uh, the, the, the finding that uh, blinding can be useful in many uh, areas, right? It can be a useful default. Uh, uh, marginalized groups are very often harmed by the inclusion of protected features, for instance, in automatic credit risk assessments. 
Um, and if we have an adversarial actor, right, blinding to uh, race might, for instance, offer some protection against abuse. We know it doesn't offer very good protection, but at least some. However, if it can be shown that um, the inclusion of protected features might actually improve outcomes for the marginalized group, then we can get a lot of approval for, uh, or at least a significant shift in approval for these race-specific uh, tailoring. Um, and the rhetoric we would see from opponents of um, uh, uh, algorithmic decision-making that includes protected features is a poor guide because everyone says their preferences are deontologically motivated when in fact they might not be. Um, and so one of the most natural policy implications that might flow from this is that we might be able to uh, pretest our algorithms. We might be able to pretest a blind versus a tailored algorithm for the impact on the marginalized group. And we might permit the use of the tailored algorithm if it actually provides better outcomes for the group we're trying to protect. This would be a form of sort of algorithmic affirmative action in the full paper. Oh, I have so much time left. Well, in the full paper, we are walking through um, different uh, uh, potential legal constraints of doing so. Um, in our view, the legal landscape is not fully clear. So many point to the Ricky or Ritchie decision as saying that uh, uh, pre-testing algorithm in this way would actually not be permitted. Our view is that uh, it's unclear whether it, 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 it could be permitted. And so here we are saying that basically uh, this pre-testing procedure might be both politically feasible and potentially legally, uh, um, an legally available um, uh, solution. Okay, and with that, maybe the last couple of minutes give me more time to ask or answer questions. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Julia. So um, there's a Q and A feature in Zoom. You can ask your questions there. I see a lot of questions in chat. We can ask your questions in chat. Um, maybe. Oh, no, no questions. Other things. <laughs> okay. Take a minute more to wait for questions and then sure. Gonzalo can get set up. Hello. I thought I said something really divisive because I saw that action in chat, um, but it was about other stuff. Maybe just among panelists. Maybe the other people don't use it. Looks like there's a question from Jose. Um, if you want to read it and answer it, go for it. Uh, are there some general conditions under which blindness is preferred? Um, so we think that uh, that determination should be made primarily based on uh, the outcomes. So basically uh, looking at uh, just comparing uh, comparing outcomes under treated versus tailored tool and then making the decision. But it's probably helpful to think more, which we sort of haven't done in this project about whether there are sort of uh, more, more analytical conditions, for instance, under which we can make predictions about um, when which one, which, when uh, the blind tool might be preferable over the tailored tool. Okay. Thanks again, Julian. In the interest of keeping things moving, uh, Gonzalo, you want to share your screen and get set up? Um, and then, Julian, you can answer any other questions in the chat. All right. So our next speaker is uh, Gonzalo Diaz, uh, and he'll be talking about proportional apportionment, a case study from the Chilean Constitutional Convention. Um, and as soon as you're ready to go, Gonzalo, go for it. Thank you. Uh, well, good afternoon. My name is Gonzalo Diaz, and I will present you this joint work with Javier Chambrano, Jose Correa, and Victor Verdugo, which I to some told you. Um, to begin with this whole story, uh, um, this begins in October uh, year 2019, where Chile had one of the biggest social protests in our recent history. And one of the main demands from people was to have a new constitution written in democracy. So this the same year, politicians from different coalitions made an agreement to begin a constitu constitutional process. So a year later, this actually began with a referendum to decide whether we want a new constitution or not. And the yes option, won by a vast majority of nearly 80% of the preferences. And finally, this year in May, we had these elections to choose our representatives to write this new constitution, 
uh, under a proportional representation system, the same used in Chile to choose our parliament representatives. But with the novelty, this mechanism, the, there was this mechanism in addition that enforced gender balance uh, in the election of the representatives. So, Gonzalo, your slides are not progressing in our view. Are not progressing. Oh, this is a problem with Zoom. Um, excuse me, I'll have to share it this way because um, it's, it seems this is not showing well the transition. Okay, we're on slide two now. Yeah, yes, this is the big protest, the political agreement, the referendum, and the actual conventional constitution who, who is writing the constitution today. Um, so this whole story inspired us to, um, to design and test new ways of implementing a proportional election, uh, with, uh, but in more dimensions to include a gender balance rule. So to begin with the one dimensional setup for proportionality, the goal here is to allocate a certain amount of seats uh, to the uh, different lists proportional on their votes. So to work this through an example, let's suppose we want to allocate 10 seats to three different lists with the votes shown here. And a way of doing this is choosing a suitable multiplier to scale our vote vector. And this way we preserve the proportionality of the, of the votes uh, it adds up to 10, but it has the problem that it's not feasible because we cannot allocate a non-integer number of seats, of course. And the way of solving this is um, to, with the division method from Mr. Jefferson and Hunt. Uh, and we also have to choose now again a suitable multiplier. There's more than one multiplier that works to scale again our vote vector and use a rounding rule specifically a downward rounding rule to scale down our vector. This is by this definition, a proportional apportionment, which is unique. This is the same method using Chilean elections in each one of the 28 districts and the same method used for the constitutional convention, but with this uh, added greedy gender balance mechanism. In addition to enforce that the same uh, number of men and women are chosen in every district. Uh, this setup allows us to extend the notion of proportionality to more dimensions. For instance, we can do an allocation in political and uh, geographical dimension. So using the same example, let's suppose these votes were casted between these two, uh, two different districts, and we want to do an allocation that preserves the former allocation we did to lists. And the way of doing this is with two-dimensional proportionality studied by Balinski and Demanche in the 89. And we basically need to scale our matrix in a certain way. And we, in this case, with two sets of multipliers, the lambda multipliers, uh, one for each list, and the mu multipliers, one for each uh, district. We now scale our matrix, we round it down, and we obtain our apportionment. This apportionment is guaranteed to exist under mild conditions and it's unique as well. And in the same sense, we extend the notion of proportionality. We can keep doing this to uh, more dimensions. Uh, this is what Sembrano et al. did in a work this year. Um, but we particularly care about a third dimension, which is gender, to implement the, our methods in a different way. So from this setup, it came uh, all of our proposals to the convention, constitutional convention method. The first one is the biproportional method, which creates a local apportionment of least gender in every district. So it works in the same way as the Chilean method, but instead of doing just a list allocation, it does this biproportional list gender allocation. So it, it implements the parity in a different way. The next one is the three proportional method, which creates a, now a global apportionment, not a district level apportionment, uh, which tells us how many uh, seats correspond to each list uh, in each district and to each gender. And this method allows uh, two interesting extensions. The first one is, is a threshold, in this case, a 3% threshold. So it filters out the list with less than 3% of, of the national votes. So this way, um, uh, we, two tiny lists don't get representation and we don't incentivate the degradation of bigger lists. And another, this is something not a novelty of us, but some, something used in countries like Germany, New Zealand, Bolivia. 
among very others. And another feature is uh, the um, uh, plurality condition, which means uh, we enforce that the most voted candidate in each district gets chosen. And finally, these two features, uh, this is a novelty of our work. Uh, we extended the proof of Tembrano et al of uh, the existence of the apportionment, studying the linear program that uh, finds this apportionment. Um, and finally, these two features can be combined again in a new method. So now looking at the different outcomes this method have in terms of the configuration of the parliaments, uh, we will begin with an inter interesting example, which are the green dots, which is the Green Ecologist Party in Chile. We can see here it's the sixth more important national political force, but despite this fact, uh, they don't get representation and their local systems um, because they are not strong enough in every district to get representations, but they do are strong enough uh, in the national level and this gives them five seats. The two more observations are how effectively the threshold eliminate these various small points uh, of tiny lists who get only one seat and how the three proportional method with plurality and threshold gives us an interesting middle ground where we don't leave where we don't completely leave aside all the local lists, but we choose just the right and important leaders in their district, which we believe it's a valuable property and a valuable balance between local and global. In the table below, I want to show particularly the, this malapportionment result. Malapportionment is a measure of how far away is the vote share and the, and the seat share of a list. And these two metrics shows us uh, how different the local apportionment and the national apportionment are. And this is the reason why uh, these local uh, methods perform worse than the global methods in terms of the national apportionment of seats to list. And it happens the other way around in case of the local malapportionment. Um, another interesting result is the experiment, experiment of robustness we run where we applied a chalk of votes, uh, randomly, uh, normally distributed to every candidate to see how many seats were transferred between two lists. And this is the distribution from various, uh, various simulation uh, is plotted here. And it's easy to see how the local method are much more sensitive to random chalks than the global ones. And in particular, the method with thresholds are the least sensitive to chalk in votes. So the results of the election uh, doesn't change much under these systems with thresholds. Finally, to begin with some conclusions, um, we presented two families of method, the global and the local ones. And the a virtue of the global method is how they avoid the problem of malapportionment in district. Uh, here's a map of Chile with the district colors according to the voting power in each one. And the global method, uh, in the global method, each vote counts. Uh, in contrast to local method, where people are constrained to their district and how much power they have to choose candidates in their district. And also, methods with plurality balance the local and national representation without sacrificing much proportionality and representativeness. Finally, the lesson here is that linear programming and algorithmic tools allows the design of new methods with valuable properties for regulatory and inclusion in democratic elections. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thanks very much, Gonzalo. So we have time for maybe one question. You can either use the Q&A feature of Zoom or the chat. We've Let's got see. one residual Q&A from the previous talk. Um, I'll read the... Okay. Now we're good. So waiting on a question. Oh. Oh, okay. All right, um, any further questions can be taken offline then. Um, that concludes the law and politics session. We'll be jumping right in next to the policy and funding section uh, session. Thanks very much, everyone.
Thank you, Sam and everyone. And the next session is Policy and Funding, as Sam said, uh, chaired by Michael Best. Hi, everyone. Um, could I ask the presenters to, can you rename yourselves? At the moment, you're just named presenter one. And oh, you said you already renamed yourself. Okay, thanks. Scott, could you rename yourself? All set. Phenomenal. All right, let's give people just another few seconds to trickle in, and then we'll hit the road. You guys know the rules, right? 15 minutes each, and then a minute for questions as you change over. Um, Scott, do you want to share your slides? So I can check if it's working. Amazing. All right, so our first presenter is Scott Commoners from Harvard. Um, take it away, 15 minutes. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm very honored to be presenting at the first edition of this conference. Uh, this is joint work with Mohamed Akbarpour and Piotr Tworzak on redistributive allocation mechanisms. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of usual, uh, you know, sort of usual commentary, uh, particularly for uh, this research agenda, you should give more than two thirds of the credit to my co-authors because in some Shapley value sense, you know, sort of all of this stuff could have happened without me, but none of it could have happened without either of them. So very good. What's our setting? We're going to be thinking about uh, allocation in contexts where non-market mechanisms are used, even though monetary transfers are available. And if you think about it for a moment, uh, these are pervasive. We see it in the context of housing with uh, you know, governments running sort of public housing programs, both at uh, local and, and national levels. We see it in healthcare, we see it in food. This is like in-kind redistribution, things like food stamps. Road access is always an interesting example because it's one where economists famously think there should be a market mechanism and you know, governments and, and you know, sort of uh, policymakers frequently choose not to institute one. Congestion pricing is sort of uniformly agreed. It would be like you know, in efficiency enhancing and you hear arguments like, but we don't want to make the roads only the uh, sort of the, the option, you know, the sort of roads at uh, peak times only available to wealthy people. Um, and you could argue, oh, but it, it might even be a Pareto improvement. And yet still you see policymakers uh, shutting down congestion pricing schemes. Um, other cases in the United States, there's uh, you know full rationing for national park permits. Uh, and then very recently, the US and many other countries used non-market mechanisms to allocate vaccines. Uh, footnote, I should advertise, uh, they'll, they'll be more using this framework to talk about vaccines on Thursday. Um, so while I reference it a little bit, we have sort of a, a fully built out application based around that particular case. But the question is like, why not use a market mechanism, which would potentially lead to more efficient outcomes? And a very common and natural answer is that there are redistributive concerns. You care not just about getting sort of the maximum value of the goods, but, but getting you care about the distribution, who actually receives the value. So what we're going to give in this paper is a market design framework for optimal allocation under redistributive concerns. Um, footnote, of course, this is like, you know, leaving aside the possibility of doing macro level redistribution. We're imagining you're a policymaker or a marketplace organizer who just controls or regulates that one market. So you can't like, you know, maximize productivity and then tax. You have to actually, you know, sort of effect whatever redistribution you want in the market you control. Um, the designer is going to be allocating goods of heterogeneous quality to agents who differ in both observable and unobservable characteristics. Uh, we're going to solve the optimal mechanism design problem subject to incentive and individual rationality constraints. And crucially, we're going to have a welfare function that re you know, reflects the redistributive concern through heterogeneous welfare weights. And what we're going to show is that the key factors that drive you know, sort of market-based redistribution are the relationship between the social preferences and the observability of agents' characteristics. So the extent to which you can actually learn about the characteristics you care about for redistribution from agents' behavior under the mechanism, um, how revenue generated by the mechanism is used. So sometimes you might want to run an efficient market simply because you can raise enough money uh, in doing so that you can then sort of effect a very you know, sort of efficient transfer to the people you care about the most. And then lastly, it's actually going to depend on the types of goods as well. So you're going to, we're going to see more um, redistribution of universally desirable goods. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about what that means, but you should think about it as, you know, sort of, you know, often representing essential goods like food or housing or healthcare, something that, um, you know, would be desirable to everybody. 
And so in particular, um, you know, if someone chooses not to, you know, chooses to forego it, chooses not to consume it, um, we infer that that's much more likely to be sort of about their their wealth or like you know ability to pay than, than necessarily their their demand. Um, this plugs into massive and multi you know multifarious literatures. Um, you know the entire concept of mechanism design with redistributive concerns is is standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, there's a incredible paper by Marty Weitzman from the 70s that sort of like set out this idea. Uh, methodologically, we're building a lot on uh, this more recent paper by Condorelli, um, and also to some degree on our prior work uh, called Redistribution Through Markets, uh, also plugs in with a bunch of other sort of, you know, public finance and price control questions, um, in-kind redistribution, auctions under budget constraints, sort of other like, you know, mechanisms where you, where you hit sort of sharp edge constraints. And then, you know, methodologically uh, plugs in with screening and generalized irony. Okay, so what's going on? We're going to imagine that we're allocating a unit mass of objects to a unit mass of agents. Uh, each object is going to have a quality, um, Q and zero, one. And agents are going to have a three-dimensional type. So there's an observable component. So this might be your profession uh, or your neighborhood, you know, sort of some public marker. Uh, there's an unobserved willingness to pay. So this is what we're going to be trying to elicit through the mechanism. Uh, so this is your willingness to pay for, uh, for quality. And then there's going to be lambda, which is an unobserved social welfare weight. And we're going to care about lambda for the purposes of allocation. And your type is going to be sort of informative about lambda. So the designer knows the type distribution. Um, but then there's this sort of welfare um, skew, I guess. Uh, if an agent of type IR lambda receives a good with quality Q and pays T, she gets utility uh, QR minus T, and her contribution to social welfare is lambda times that. So your welfare contribution, you know, is, is weighted by lambda, but remember lambda is unobserved. So we're going to be trying to learn about lambda using what we can see and what we learn about your type through the mechanism. So market designer uses arbitrary direct allocation mechanisms, standard mechanism design framework. There's nothing unusual on this frame, on this slide. Um, you know, there, you get to choose a probability of allocation to agents of each types, uh, subject to feasibility, incentive, individual rationality, and, uh, you know, no subsidy constraints. And the designer is going to maximize a weighted sum of revenue and utility. Uh, so the designer sort of both cares about this, this weighted utility, and then also possibly revenue with a, you know, with a weight alpha. And so that weight alpha, as I mentioned, is actually going to like plug into the, the question of what is optimal, uh, because we're going to sort of think about whether there's a revenue objective that's either, you know, sort of designer level, you know, sort of collecting revenue as a company, say, or public, like is alpha being used to buy a public good for the people in the market or something of the sort. And sort of the key insight uh, here and, and in our prior work is that the designer is going to be forming expectations over the social welfare weights, given what they see in the market. So, you know, the designer can't observe Lambda directly, and instead what they're going to sort of quote unquote observe is the expectation of Lambda given the observable and revealed information. And what does that mean economically? It means that the designer is in some sense estimating agents need. Right? So if you think of lambda as representing the, you know, the extent to which you want to transfer value to that agent, you can think of this as like you know, their, their need um, or their, you know, their value for money. Like how much do we socially weight giving one unit of util to, uh, to that agent? Um, we can learn this in two ways. Right? We can learn this from what we can observe about you. We might know that you live in a less, you know, a less privileged area or um, you know, that you're in a profession that we particularly um, you know, place social weight on. So think about vaccines, we might place like a really high social welfare weight on doctors, um, both because they are, putting them, you know, they are putting themselves at risk and that they are helping other people. Um, so we might care a lot about um, you know, sort of shifting welfare to doctors. Um, that could all depend on I, right? Those are observable things, your neighborhood, your profession, uh, but also elicitable information. So like, your relative need, like your willingness to pay for something also reveals information about your, your type, and it might reveal something about how much we want to contribute to you, right? 
And so what this is going to mean is that the optimal allocation rule is going to de depend on the statistical correlation of the labels and the willingness to pay with the unobserved social welfare weights. So our ability to do sort of optimal redistributive allocation depends on how much we learn about Lambda from the information we observe and elicit. Footnote on technics, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna go into this much in the talk, but there's, there's some like really beautiful uh, mathematical machinery um, that makes it possible to find the optimal mechanism in a really clean way. Um, it has sort of a very natural structure First thing that's happening is basically objects of the different quality levels are allocated across the groups. So you sort of like split the um, you know the objects across the groups, and then within group, they're allocated uh, you know sort of under some optimal allocation rule. And what's going on? Like how are we choosing this split? We're sort of like we're being greedy. We're trying to always maximize the marginal expected social return of the marginal quality unit across groups. Right. So we basically like compute the optimal within group allocation for each group. And then you, you apportion out the, you know, the quality levels um, to maximize the marginal return conditional on what you're going to be doing within group. Um, so more, you know, sort of more, more of that um, in, in the paper and or in, in longer versions of the talk. But, uh, but suffice it to say, it's, it's really clean and it's a greedy algorithm, which is what you would expect. You're sort of, you're greedy with respect to social, marginal social welfare, again, under these expected welfare weights. And so from there, the real sort of economic substance is we can, you know, we can extract out intuition about when you want to use in-kind versus, in-kind redistribution versus not. So what, first of all, let's be formally precise, in-kind redistribution is going to be random allocation of the good at some range of quality levels, you know, at below market prices. So we're going to basically have rationing at prices that are fixed, you know, below the market clearing level, possibly at zero. Um, and roughly what you want to do with this is when we can observe things that let us uncover inequality in the welfare weights. So when we can sort of use the, um, you know, use the information in the market to discover inequality that we would like to you know sort of address through redistribution so one case is what we call label revealed inequality this is when the average pareto weight on a given group exceeds the weight on revenue um so you know think you can think of this weight on revenue alpha as representing like what the social value of just like collecting a dollar of revenue is if the social value of, of you know you know sort of transferring utility to a group is higher than that then you want at least some kind of in-kind redistribution um, so long as the good itself is, is sufficiently valuable. And this is going to be this universal desirability I mentioned, right? You don't want to use in-kind redistribution for things that some people just don't want. Um, you know, you'd much rather like, you know, necessarily, you'd much rather raise revenue for them. Um, but to at least in the extent that you know that an entire group wants something, and again, thinking about essential goods like food or housing, um, you know, then you actually want in kind redistribution, simply if you can observe that there that the average welfare weight within a group is high, and this gives a really strong justification for devices like you know, for policies like food stamps, right? You know, you're you're not worried about a small number of people receiving food stamps who don't need them because the vast majority of people who receive them really really need them. So the the average welfare weight is super high. The other context, incidentally, where you want to do this in-kind redistribution is when you have inequality that's revealed through willingness to pay. So this is when welfare weights are strongly negatively correlated with willingness to pay. So when you see someone not willing to pay for something, you infer that they must be really in need. So this is like, you know, life-saving medical treatment. If somebody chooses to not buy a life-saving medical treatment, our inference is that that person, you know, is probably not choosing not to buy it because they prefer not to have it, but rather that they just do not have the means. And so that's the second case where in-kind redistribution is really important. The flip side of that um, in the last two minutes uh, is when to use market mechanisms. That is, when do you want to actually use market clearing prices to do a sort of matching on quality? And roughly that's when either revenue or efficiency dominates versus redistributive concerns. Now that's like almost tautological the way I just said it, um, but precisely what is this? So sometimes you're actually trying to maximize revenue. And that might be, again, because you as the firm just place a high weight on revenue, or it might be because you as the social planner have a really efficient way to use it relative to the average Pareto weight. Um, so think allocating goods to corporations when you know, the Pareto weights might be low, or when you can use lump sum transfers or some really you know, sort of efficient public good. And then secondarily, efficiency maximization. 
which is here when the welfare weights are not strongly correlated with willingness to pay. So, uh, you know, perfect. So that's when you have a small dispersion in welfare weights to begin with, um, or a large dispersion, but little correlation with willingness to pay, right? So if there's no inequality, then you, you want a market allocation, or also if you learn nothing from willingness to pay about inequality, think it's like milk or something where, you know, you're not willing to buy it, doesn't really symbolize need, but more likely symbolizes a choice of taste. Um, you know, then there's nothing we can do. We can't use the market to redistribute in an, in an effective way. And so you might as well use an efficient allocation. All right, so that's the story. We introduced a model of optimal allocation under general redistributive concerns and highlighted three different factors that sort of drive when you want to do in-kind redistribution. Um, and, you know, there's far more to think about this space. Uh, I mentioned we're going to do a, an application that sort of like uses a version of this model to, you know, with externalities to talk about vaccines two days from now. Um, but there's tons of stuff about this model that is sort of like, you know, very, very first cut-ish relative to how we think about redistribution, especially it's very ex-ante and we often care about ex-post fairness, especially in, in an audience like today's. Um, it's also very linear and we tend to think, especially for populations that are at risk, linearity is not a good assumption, right? Income effects matter, risk aversion matters, you know, ability to invest matters. Uh, and then of course, like all of this lives in a broader environment of like classical economic models of redistribution. And we haven't said anything about how this relates. Cool. QED, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Scott. I think we have time for one question if anyone's got a burning question. Otherwise, the, the chat is open. So please feel free to make uh, comments and questions in there. And Yusuke, do you want to pull up your slides while we wait? I think maybe questions in the chat is going to be simpler. So let's move straight on to the next uh, talk. Uh, Yusuke from Yale is going to tell, tell us about algorithms experiment. You get 15 minutes. I'll try and give you a two minute and a one minute warning. Um, take it away. Great. So thanks a lot for having me. So today I'm going to talk about uh, algorithm as experiment. So this is an uh, econometric or statistical method project inspired by a variety of applied domains in the subtitle. So this is a joint work with Kohei Yata, uh, who is a job market candidate in econometrics at my home institution, Yale's economics department. The motivation for this project is very simple. So needless to explain to this cloud, but now it's sort of the golden age of decision-making algorithms, right? There is algorithms in machine learning and market design and many other domains are now creating a growing fraction of treatment decisions and recommendations. The goal of this project is to take a specific econometric or a causal inference book at the surge of algorithmic resource allocation and decision-making. That is, we are going to claim that these algorithmic treatment decisions and recommendations produce very high quality natural experiments or instrumental variables that are useful for, for doing causal inference and impact evaluation. That is, we are going to claim that algorithm is natural experiment in a very broad and general sense. Now, why is it the case that algorithm is natural experiment? So let me start with very high level intuition. So imagine that some algorithm is learning to make some final decision or recommendation, which I denote by Z. And this algorithm make, makes this decision Z based on a bunch of input variables, which I denote by X. Then by definition or by construction, nothing else will directly influence this final decision Z other than these input variables, right? Because any computational algorithm is defined to use only a pre-specified set of input variables. Therefore, conditional on X, focusing on individuals or situations with similar values of X, this algorithm out of Z is gonna be independent from anything else. As a result, this algorithmic decision Z works as a good instrumental variable for whatever treatment, which we are interested in at the end of the day. In other words, this algorithm out of Z satisfies the key conditional independence requirement. The agenda of this project is to formalize and operationalize this intuition okay, as a widely applicable estimator of treatment effects. 
So we are going to start with an identification analysis where we exactly characterize okay, what causal effects we can identify when we have data coming from a data generating algorithm. And we provide this identification analysis for a big class of algorithms containing both stochastic and deterministic algorithms. And this analysis clarifies that the data from almost every algorithm allows us to identify some causal effect. Then in the main theoretical part, we transform this identification analysis into a practical treatment effect estimator. And we formally prove that our proposed estimator is consistent and asymptotically normal for a well-defined causal effects, even if there are lots of heterogeneities in treatment effects. And this treatment effect estimator is also very easy to implement, even if the input variable vector x is high dimensional and contains lots of elements, and even if the decision-making algorithm is very complex. So even if the decision-making algorithm contains some crazy component, say deep learning, the final treatment effect estimator remains very simple. A key special case of our proposed estimator is a high dimensional extension of the regression discontinuity design or RDD. That in the previous framework, imagine that the vector X contains a bunch of learning variables that jointly determine treatment assignment or recommendation. Then the previous framework clearly contains a multi-dimensional regression discontinuity design with any number of learning variables, right? So we effectively provide a consistent and asymptotically normal estimator that can be applied to such a high-dimensional RDD. In terms of applications and examples, there are lots of potential applications of our framework. So one big group of potential applications is coming from decision making based on machine learning algorithms. So we may use some simple supervised machine learning or more sophisticated bandit and reinforcement learning type dynamic optimization algorithms. So no matter what specific algorithm is used, the resulting uh, data coming from machine learning algorithms uh, provides examples of our framework. On top of that, there are many social and economic applications as well. Say, so think about centralized mechanism design algorithms, auctions, and matching algorithms. These are some sort of complicated examples of decision making algorithms that transform observable data like bit as bits into the final decision making about who gets what at what prices, right? So, therefore, such mechanism design algorithms are also examples of our framework. Finally, uh, public policy eligibility rules are the final category of our primary examples. Say in Medicaid and bankruptcy laws, whether each of us is eligible for that policy or not is often determined by some algorithmic rule based on observable characteristics like our income level and the family composition and so on. Then such public policy eligibility rules are also examples of decision-making algorithms so that they provide examples of our framework. Then in the spirit of this final category of policy eligibility rules, we provide an original application of our method to evaluate a hospital relief funding distributed by the US government during the COVID-19 pandemic. So this framework or this policy domain used some algorithmic rule to determine whether each hospital is eligible for funding or not. So we will apply our method to data from this policy uh, to evaluate whether hospital funding had any impacts on hospital activities related to COVID-19. And our empirical bottom line is that this funding policy uh, appeared to have no impacts on any hospital activity whatsoever related to COVID-19. Then here is the theoretical framework, okay? Imagine that there are a bunch of individuals I, and each individual I has a vector of fixed covariates Xi, which contains P elements. Then each person first receives some binary treatment recommendation denoted by ZI. The most critical assumption is that this binary treatment recommendation ZI is assumed to be made by some known algorithm, which I denote by A. And this A is a function from each covariate value into some number in the unit interval. The interpretation is that the output of this function is the conditional probability of a treatment recommendation for individuals with certain covariate values, okay? Then note that this algorithm may be deterministic in the sense that the output of this algorithm may be either one or zero. 
Then after this treatment recommendation, each person gets the final treatment assignment, which I denote by B. And based on this treatment assignment, each person will finally generate the observed outcome, which I denote by YI. So this is a very standard instrumental variable framework with the additional colored highlighted twist that the, the treatment recommendation or the instrumental variable Z is made by some known algorithms. Then the key property or assumption about this framework is this conditional independence property. That is whether each person gets the treatment recommendation Z or not, depends only on observable characteristics contained in X. So conditional on X, the treatment recommendation Z okay, needs to be independent from anything else, especially potential outcomes and the potential treatment assignments uh, in brackets. And note that this is often a true property or a fact guaranteed by the construction of the algorithm. So this is closer to some underlying property than a real assumption. So our goal is to make, okay, provide some treatment effect estimator in this environment. But to make sure that everybody is on the same page, okay, now let me provide a few familiar special cases to understand uh, what this framework is about. So one of the simplest special case of this framework is probably stratified RCT or the propensity score scenario, I think. That is, imagine that the treatment recommendation probability A of X is always strictly between zero and one so that it's stochastic. Then this is just a stratified experiment conditioned stratified on observable characteristics X. And we know what we should do in this setup. But our framework also contains a fundamentally different scenarios as well. Imagine that this input vector X contains just a scalar learning variable. And the condition around any value of X, the treatment recommendation probability A of X is degenerate, so that's zero or one. But as we move across different values of the running variable, there are certain jumps or discontinuities in the treatment recommendation probability. This is the typical regression discontinuity design or RDD scenario, which is also a special case of our framework. So our framework is really an integration of the classic propensity score scenario and the RDD scenario. And this integration allows us to contain many other interesting scenarios like machine learning and market design and the high dimensional RDD setup. And for this general setup, there is no standard estimator available. So our goal is to provide an easy to use treatment effect estimator that can be used to, in any special case of this framework. And here is our proposal. So if you are an empirical researcher, uh, this slide is the only thing you need to remember from this project. So our question is how to use a data set coming from the previous setup to estimate the causal effect of the endogenous treatment D on the final outcome Y. And our proposal is the following two-step estimator. The first step is simple brute force simulation. So let's first fix a small bandwidth delta as well as a large number S of simulations. And given these numbers, let's first simulate X star one to X star S. And these are independent dollars from the uniform distribution over the delta ball around each individual eye's covariate point. That is in the covariate space, each individual eye has a certain covariate point, right? Then around it, let's think about a small neighbor. Okay. Then we span some uniform distribution over that neighborhood and we draw a bunch of simulation draws from, from that uniform distribution. Then let's substitute each simulation draw into function A to compute the associated treatment recommendation probability. Finally, we are going to take the empirical average over S simulation draws to compute this blue object, P of X delta. So this P of X delta okay, is the approximate treatment recommendation probability okay, averaged over a small neighborhood around each individual eye's covariate. Then the second step simply combines the first step simulated blue object with the standard two stage least square instrumental variable regression. That is, up to the end of the day, we are interested in how the outcome Y is influenced by treatment D. But since D is not randomly assigned, we need to instrument for this treatment D by some instrumental variable Z. 
And our preferred instrument Z is the output of the algorithm. Then to control, to make this instrument a good instrumental variable quasi randomly assigned, we propose to linearly control for the blue object coming from the first step simulation. And our main result is that this beta coefficient coming from this two step estimator is consistent and asymptotically normal for a well defined causal effect. So therefore, this simple two-step estimator uh, is a good enough estimator when we would like to estimate a treatment effect based on some data coming from any decision-making algorithm, either deterministic or stochastic. Then as an empirical application, we apply our method to evaluate the impact of the so-called CARES Act, that is Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act. And this is probably uh, by far the largest economic stimulus package ever done over the US history, at least since the World War II. And this act distributed hundreds of billions of dollars in relief funding uh, to struggling hospitals during the COVID-19 pandemic. And their concern was that financially insecure hospitals may be less capable of investing in COVID-19 response efforts. Then we use our method to answer the question of whether this concern was alleviated by this massive amount of funding or not. Then we utilize the institutional feature that this act distributed funding according to some algorithmic rule, and we estimate the amount of funding on hospital activities uh, related to COVID-19 patients. And the bottom line is something like this. If we simply naively use some OLS regression or uncontrolled IV regression, then we tend to find uh, substantially positive and statistically significant quote unquote effects of funding on the number of COVID-19 patients hospitalized by each hospital. But once we introduce the control for that blue object, which I explained, okay, our method reveals that the previous okay, uh, effects of funding was entirely due to selection bias. And this hospital funding didn't have any causal impact on the number of COVID-19 patients hospitalized by each hospital. So our method sort of reveals the concern that the previous hospital funding regime was not well designed. So the bottom line is that as algorithmic decision making aids the world, the world becomes a mountain of natural experiments and instrumental variables. And to utilize such algorithm produced experiments, uh, a general approach is our proposal that is a simple two stage least square regression with the additional control for the so-called approximated propensity score, which can be implemented by simple simulation. But that, that's it for now. And th thank you so much for uh, your time and attention. Fantastic. Thanks, Yusuke. Um, if there's a, a question in the Q&A, we can take it now. Otherwise, I think we can uh, move on to the next paper. The, the Q&A is open, so feel free to type your questions in there. OK. Okay, I think uh, our next talk is from Samson Knight from Brown. Can you try sharing your slides? Mm -hmm. All right. Fantastic. Let me just. I'll give you two minutes and one minute warnings, and uh, Great. 15 minutes is yours. Great. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us for this talk. Um, I love the previous two talks, and I uh, particularly. Uh, I think this paper is going to be dealing with some very similar questions to the first talk, but from a very different direction. Um, so I'm really excited to see um, how they speak to each other and uh, what you guys think. Um, so basically, this talk is going to think about um, government allocations in a really similar way, where we're saying that um, governments often um, target welfare towards particular groups of people. Um, but the reasons they do so are often... Um, hard to weigh against each other. Governments target welfare towards the poor, both because they believe that the poor um, may be like more deserving of help, um, but also because a dollar will probably go further for, towards helping a poor person than it will towards helping the wealthy. The marginal utility of a dollar will be higher if you target your welfare towards the poor. Um, but these, whether or not you're uh, um, using one metric or another has pretty strong implications for how you wanna design 
uh, your welfare programs. If you're really targeting the maximum bang per buck, um, that might imply a different program design than if you're just trying to um, like maximize the welfare weights of like a particular group of people. Um, and so what we're gonna think about in this project is basically we're gonna kind of uh, start from an alternative perspective here where we're um, basically going to perform sort of a revealed preference and uh, uh, analysis of how programs are designed and try to infer the implicit weightings over um, these two different ways of prioritizing folks. Um, so we're gonna say, kind of invert the problem and, and instead of saying not necessarily um, along with how should policymakers make these trade-offs, let's look at the programs that do exist and let's try and infer how are they making these trade-offs. Um, and then we can see if they actually align with uh, what we think our value should be. So the basic intuition of this is um, in a given allocation uh, for a welfare program that's primarily targeted at the poor, this could be coming from the government caring more about helping the poor uh, and the program just helps everybody the same. It could also be that the program, the government has no special uh, uh, desire to help the poor in particular, but the poor just benefit more and so they receive more of the, of the welfare program. It could even be that the government loves the rich much more than the poor, but the, the benefits are so lopsided that we end up with a net benefit going more towards the poor. Um, and basically the, the intuition that we're going to be using in our um, estimation procedure is we're going to say that in a lot of programs we can we have information on this left-hand side and on this right-hand side where we know the we can estimate the marginal effects of a program and we can see how the program is being allocated and we can use that information to deduce the middle column. And then once we have all of that information, um, we can use this to audit the program design and see if it's actually aligning with our objectives. Um, we're going to apply this to Mexico's Progresa anti-poverty program, which is their kind of flagship redistribution program. Um, and we're going to look at, we're going to take benefits of who benefits the most, or uh, estimates of who benefits the most, um, basically uh, uh, estimates of the heterogeneous treatment effects over different groups of people. We're gonna look at how the program is allocated and then we're going to infer both the policymakers' welfare weights over households and what types of outcomes are being prioritized in terms of uh, um, which heterogeneous impacts are being um, uh, uh, prioritized in the program design. And then from that, we're actually then gonna be able to kind of uh, uh, reframe the discussion about um, how we want to design this program to sort of uh, uh, use this framework to imagine counterfactuals where the program is designed in a different way and then estimate how uh, that might change the implicit valuations um, from the program design to better align um, policy design with actual valuations as we imagine them a priori. Um, so uh, just to give you guys a preview of the results, um, for this particular program, uh, we're going to find that uh, the ranking can be explained to a large extent by these heterogeneous effects over households and differential welfare weights. Particularly important is going to be a household's indigenous status and their income, which I think makes a lot of sense from what people expect. Um, we have pretty imprecise estimates on the actual valuations over outcomes, but they are consistent with uh, kind of literature estimates of how much uh, uh, certain health and schooling outcomes should be worth. Um, and we're going to find that counterfactuals would have had uh, marginal impacts on balance, but that it wouldn't have um, completely changed the program's effects. Um, this relates uh, to a lot of the literature already actually uh, uh, spread out on the, the first presentation. Uh, but uh, in particular, we're going to be thinking about the targeting and taxation literature, also the progressive literature as well. Um, and we're also going to relate this literature to a broader kind of um, machine learning literature that's come up recently around fairness, uh, welfare, and um, part of the impetus for starting this project is the um, innovations in estimating heterogeneous treatment effects that kind of allow us to identify these different dimensions of prioritization uh, to a degree that hasn't been possible before. Um, so first, I'm going to sketch out like a very basic social welfare model. Um, and that's going to motivate sort of like how we're going to uh, break apart uh, priorities over um, different outcomes and priorities over different types of individuals. Um, so I think this will look familiar to a lot of you guys. It's basically a social planner problem where we're going to be summing utilities over individuals. Individuals will be weighted according to a welfare weight, which in our context is mu, but in the last presentation would correspond to their lambda. Um, and here we're going to have our mu be a function of, uh, of characteristics. Um, so your welfare weight is going to determine is going to be based on your observables. Um, so abstracting away from a lot of the, um, the really fun nuance of that earlier talk. Um, and then we're going to say that uh, your utility is a um, 
function of like a weighted sum over outcomes. So uh, kind of weighted sum over um, how healthy your household is, how uh, whether your kids are going to school, uh, how much consumption you enjoy. Um, and then the benefit in terms of the social planner's perspective from providing a welfare program to a household um, is going to be basically the differential impact of the program on these uh, outcomes um, multiplied by the welfare weight on that household. Um, the policymaker is going to rank the households according to uh, priority ranking, um, which is going to be a very convenient gumbel error term uh, to allow us to estimate this with ordinal logit in a framework that I think a lot of, will be familiar to a lot of folks here. Um, so basically, the step this is a two-step procedure where we're going to start by estimating the heterogeneous treatment effects of a program, um, and then we're going to uh, use these estimates of the heterogeneous impacts to infer the mu and the lambdas over, uh, which are the welfare weights over households and the impact weights over outcomes. Um, and then with these together, we'll have like the whole proposed system of how um, programs are implicitly valuing different types of households and different types of outcomes. Um, the identification here is basically coming from uh, both the differences in the ranking and the differences in the program impacts. So we're able to identify these two dimensions of priority because we now have two dimensions of variation over the households where the policymakers are prioritizing some households over others. And also the program is impacting some households more than others. Um, and these two together will allow us to identify the full system of equations. Um, so Progressa was, um, is a very well studied program um, in large part because Mexico implemented it um, via an RCT. Um, they had a, a staggered rollout over uh, impoverished villages in Mexico. Um, and so they have really uh, well identified treatment effects. Um, and they also targeted households using a household poverty index, which is gonna be our uh, metric here of government priorities over households. Um, so we're going to follow that same two-step two -step procedure that I just laid out, where we're going to first estimate heterogeneous effects um, over households using causal forests. Um, that's going to allow us to get really precise heterogeneity over different outcomes. Um, and then we're going to characterize the revealed preferences uh, implicit in the government design using uh, these measures of welfare weights and the impact weights. Um, then we're going to lay out how once we have this full system, um, we can basically project what would have happened if the government had designed the program differently and um, try to reframe the discussion about how this program should have been targeted. Um, so to start with, just to kind of um, give us a baseline of comparison, um, we're just going to run an ordinal logit of um, the priority ranking over observable household characteristics. This doesn't try to separate how differential household, how different households were affected differentially by the program. This is just going to look at which households were actually given um, uh, the welfare program. And we're going to find that the program is being allocated to indigenous households, um, to poorer households, and then especially to households with um, lots of kids. Um, and then we're going to add our methods. So first, we're going to estimate these heterogeneous treatment effects. We find a lot of heterogeneity. Um, we find on average that increases consumption, that it reduces sickness and reduces um, missed school days. The two of the outcomes here are measured as bad. So negative um, uh, average impacts are a good thing. That's the program working. Um, we find that um, household income, household size are very determinative of these uh, different uh, heterogene uh, heterogeneous impacts. Um, and then we're going to add it to our framework. And basically what we're going to find here is that um, Indigenous households, their welfare weight goes up when we take into account the fact that they're being prioritized in the ranking despite not having as strong uh, treatment effects from the program. So in order to basically account for their uh, um, uh, positive variation in, in the, the scoring function, it must be that their welfare weights are higher than it would seem naively. Um, and we're going to basically be able to say that uh, the... Uh, um, the relative priority is going to be stronger for indigenous and poorer households um, in these contexts. Um, and uh, we're going to get really noisy estimates for the implied valuation over um, impacts. Those standard errors in parentheses are really, really big. Um, and we're actually seeing the, the, the biggest thing we're seeing here really is that um, heterogeneity in impacts over uh, um, sickness and missed schooling does not seem to have very much explanatory power over um, placement in this uh, priority ranking. We're seeing that uh, a lot of the 
um, uh, the sort of like weight on the program um, is going through sort of uh, is, is not being channeled through the uh, relative impacts over um, the causal effects. Um, and so the first thing that we're going to try and do with this framework then is basically try to evaluate what happened when the government changes their ranking system. So something that's really nice about Progressa is they actually updated um, how they were targeting households in 2003. And so we can run this procedure for the first uh, priority ranking and then the second priority ranking. And in this kind of stable framework, evaluate how this change in targeting um, adjusted the implicit prioritization across different groups. And so we're going to find that in 2003, um, the government implicitly started prioritizing indigenous households more, um, but started putting much less weight on poorer households uh, uh, or on uh, households income. Um, we're going to find that there's moderately more weight on the uh, like actual outcomes of households, but the again, the variance of those estimates is too large to make any strong claims. Um, then uh, what we're going to do, as I described before, is we can actually um, use this framework to basically uh, frame a discussion about alternate allocation rules. So how could we have designed this program um, if we like feel that we disagree with some of these uh, these uh, uh, impact weights? How could have we redesign the program to target different households differently? Um, and what would have been the results? Um, because we actually have estimates of the heterogeneous impact weights, we have uh, enough information to not just project out who would have gotten the um, the program, but what would have been the average outcome levels. Um, so we can see that um, the uh, a, a allocation here, oops, sorry, um, an allocation that had basically no welfare weights um, over uh, different households um, would have effectively, uh, we can see kind of like on the bottom row, the average consumption levels um, could have been targeted to increase the uh, basically the average impact of the program overall if you're not caring at all about welfare weights over different types of households. Um, but then once you reintroduce the fact that the uh, program is actually targeting, um, especially like, like poor households, then we see that the average consumption levels would actually have to be traded off against a higher welfare weight on targeted households that may not be the ones for which you see the largest uh, relative impact. Um, we can then say that because our impact weights, for example, are estimated with a lot of noise, we can just impose impact weights inferred from the literature um, and say that these are the levels of um, prioritization that we want to put on certain types of outcomes. And then we can project what the types of uh, program design would have been if those were uh, um, sort of within our framework. Um, and then finally, we can imagine ourselves as only caring about one outcome or another and basically um, uh, 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 put ourselves in the position of a policymaker who basically just wants to maximize um, given welfare weights um, over particular types of outcomes. Um, and then we're also, I'm just going to skip this part, we're also running a survey of um, households in Mexico to try and uh, uh, get at welfare weights in another uh, direction and see how well our inferred welfare weights uh, correspond to those that um, people uh, reveal through surveys as sort of what they, what types of families they would like to be targeted by welfare. So basically, we're trying to introduce here a tool that would allow policymaking to kind of, um, rather than sort of have this two-step process of you design a policy and then you implement it, kind of have a, a cycle where you design it, you implement it, you see who's being impacted, you see who's being implicitly prioritized, and then you redesign. Um, and sort of it, it allows a mechanism of, um, of, of auditing existing policy design and then realigning these policies with the um, stated objectives. Um, great, and uh, uh, thanks everyone for, for listening. That's our, that's our presentation. Thanks so much. I think um, in the interest of time, we should probably shuffle along to our next presentation. Uh, but of course, the, the Q&A and the chat are open. So do um, put your questions in there if you have them. Um, so Lucius, are you going to present? OK, perfect. So Lucius from NYU is going to yes. tell us about disaggregated interventions to reduce inequality. You have uh, 10 minutes, and we'll start now. Great, thank you. Uh, so. Our paper is titled Disaggregated Interventions to Reduce Inequality, and this is joint work with Josh Loftus at LSE and Julia Stoyanovich at NYU. 
Here's a quick outline of the talk. I'll start by introducing our framework called the impact remediation problem. Then we'll go through some background on the different components of the framework, that's disaggregation and causal models. Uh, we'll then talk about how we can use our setup to find optimal interventions with a focus on disparity. And we'll walk through an example, and I'll close with a quick overview and discussion of areas we can build. We've been calling our problem of interest the impact remediation problem. And the goal in this problem is to find a useful formalization of existing real world disparities that ultimately will allow us to approach them with algorithmic tools. So at a high level in our formalization, we first observe an existing disparity that we consider undesired. Then second, for now, let's assume we've come up with an intervention that might help. And third, we want to use our intervention to decrease the measured disparity. That's the high level overview. And here's a quick toy example to make this concrete. Imagine there's gender imbalance in a job applicant pool. And the intervention we can perform, just as an example, is hosting booths at career fairs, where we only want to rebalance our applicant pool with respect to gender. We can imagine other examples as well, such as increasing access to resources like vaccines, housing, or education, but keep that job applicant example in mind. We'll return to it as we go through the talk. Our formalization here is aimed at a pretty broad range of real world problems. So the corresponding research context is also very broad. Related areas include measurement, sociology, economic policy, causal inference, and optimization. And with such a broad range of topics, we can't cover a full list of every related paper. So here I'll just talk about the main starting points for our work. So the first paper in the list, Kuzner et al., looks at using causal models and optimization to maximize the real world impact of interventions. And that's our main starting point that we wanna build on where instead of maximizing impact, we'll focus on disparity. Uh, another key difference in our work is our use of disaggregation. And that's an idea discussed in this second group of papers here, which unpack concepts like race in particular and how that interacts with causal modeling and counterfactuals. And I'll talk more about disaggregation in the next slide. I've listed a few other papers here from related lines of work, but for time's sake, I won't go into more detail on those at the moment. So for context, there's an ongoing and I would say pretty vocal debate right now within the research community about how to use social categories like race and gender in causal inference. And today I'm not going to argue for any particular view of race or social categories. There's a lot of nuance there, but I think it's important to mention to see how this discussion overlaps with impact remediation and informs the framework that we come up with. On the left here, I've drawn a causal graphical model and that's just a pictorial representation of which variables we believe cause which other variables. So looking at this diagram, it states that our outcome is a function of some treatment as well as some social category. And if we change the value of one of the parent nodes, then the child node will change as a result. And the debate centers around whether or not we can model social categories as causal variables at all. In other words, whether or not we can draw this picture here at all, where the social category is one of the treatments. And to give you a quick sense of the types of questions discussed there, we might ask, what does a social category like race mean? Or what would it mean to intervene on or change someone's race in a mathematical model, the way we would change a treatment? And we could have a long discussion about that debate. Again, I'm not advocating for any particular view there, but what I want you to take away today is just that whatever we choose to do mathematically with social categories, our modeling decisions will end up translating to sociological assumptions. So the approach we've taken in impact remediation is to relax our required modeling assumptions to the point where we're able to avoid many of the difficulties of thinking about social categories as treatments. For impact remediation, we measure a disparity across groups of people, and that can be racial categories, genders, disabilities, or really any criteria, social category or not. And we do still need to think deeply about how we're categorizing people because we won't see what we don't measure but now we don't have to worry about social categories as treatments. We have our corresponding graphical model on the bottom here, where instead of having the social category as one of the treatments, we've now disaggregated our outcome across the different groups of interest. And here I've just written arbitrary groups A and B as an example. So with that understanding of disaggregation, I wanna talk about the rest of the framework we've set up for this impact remediation problem. Essentially, what are the ingredients? We have N individuals, Returning to our example from before, say 425 potential job applicants. We have M subpopulations on which we can intervene, say two universities. I'll also refer to these as intervention sets or sets of people for which we can intervene. 
We have our subpopulations across which we see a disparity. Let's consider binary gender for now with female as group A and male as group B and our outcome of interest Y that's disaggregated. Y could be the fraction of students who applied for the job. We have real world features X. Let's say X is the number of career counselors at each university. And this could be any number of features. We'll just think about one for now. And last, we have our possible intervention, e, whether or not we hosted a booth at the career fair. So for today's talk, I'm going to restrict the causal model we consider to be one that looks like the graph on the right here, where X and Z have no unobserved confounding or causal relationship between them, and they both affect our outcome Y for each group. We'll also allow for interference here, where the outcomes Y for one unit, one university, depend on the treatment of both units, both Z1 and Z2. So say, for example, these two universities partner and they allow their students to attend either career fair. Uh, notice we have a multi-level nested structure here where we care about these N individuals, the 425 applicants across gender, but our intervention occurs at a group level over the M intervention sets, the two universities. Now that we have some notation describing our framework, how would we actually use our setup to rebalance that applicant pool with respect to gender? To quickly demonstrate what that might look like, I've added some example numbers and equations here to walk through. So up top, we have counts for students in each gender group at each university, adding up to our 425 total students. And imagine we've observed the following application rates in the second line there for each group at each university where group B has higher application rates at both locations. And say, for example, we decide to define disparity as the absolute difference in overall application rates between groups A and B, notated here as delta Z. So if we have a causal model, and this is the same picture from the previous slide, then we can estimate the effects of our interventions Z on the disaggregated outcomes YA and YB. And so just for the sake of demonstration, say we get the following expected outcome rates where our interventions potentially affect each group Z. Then using those estimates, we can compute our disparity measure before and after intervention. And we see that with no intervention, we have delta about equal to 0.08. With intervention at university one, even though we've improved application rates for every group, uh, delta stays about the same. But with intervention at university two, we're able to decrease our measure of disparity to 0.06. So for this toy example, our optimal way to rebalance these applicant pools with respect to gender is to host a career fair booth at university two. So to recap, under the framework we just laid out, a high level process goes like this. First, we decide how we're looking at disparities, what categories of people we may or may not consider. Uh, with those step one decisions made, step two is then to learn or assume a causal model and fit it to the data in order to estimate the effects of our interventions. Step three, we define our objective. We decide how do we want to mitigate the observed disparity? Maybe that's closing the gap between groups like we saw in our example in the previous slide, or maybe we instead want to get everyone over a fixed threshold. And there are several options there. And then finally, step four, we find an optimal set of interventions subject to whatever constraints we have, which could, for example, be budget constraints. So in our toy example, in the previous slide, we had only two intervention sets, and we were able to enumerate all possible interventions. But in a larger decision problem, with more intervention sets or more complicated constraints, that step can be done with a mixed integer linear program, for example. So that's the overview. And we can see that there are many research areas that our framework connects to. So we can think of somewhat distinct modules here of modeling treatment functions, optimal policy learning, and then bringing those together to tackle existing inequality problems with our disaggregated approach. And in the paper, we're able to talk a bit more about how this framework connects to these research areas. I would also encourage you to have a look at the paper for a more comprehensive and realistic demonstration of impact remediation beyond the toy example we saw here. And these are some of the figures from that example. So feel free to check out the paper for details. Here are some references. And that's all I have. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Lucius. Um, so I think we have time for a question if there is one that's um, uh, on somebody's mind at the moment. Otherwise, um, we will move on. The Q&A will stay open for a little bit longer, so I don't know. All right, um, 
I want to thank everyone who's uh, participating and especially thank uh, all of the presenters uh, for their wonderful presentations. Uh, let me hand over to Radiet, who's got a couple of announcements, I think, for the, for the group as a whole. Right, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Uh, how about now? Yes, that's better. Oh. Okay, is it better? Okay, very good. All right, someone is going to make this mistake today. So happy to be happy to be the person who makes that mistake. Um, yeah, just a quick announcement that concludes our very first day for the presentations. Thank you to all the presenters, the keynote speakers, the discussants, everything that we've had uh, so far. Um, we're going to now head over to Gather uh, for our regional social. So uh, if you're not yet on Gather, please join. We're going to be there for uh, 45 minutes, I believe, and uh, and we hope to see you all back at 8 a.m. Pacific tomorrow morning.